All right, this is like, super exciting to, to 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 be together. I mean, you know, we all uh, live uh, Ashwin, John, and I live, eat, and breathe this every day. So um, this topic is is something that that we're swimming in, and and I think it's something that can really be um, you know misconstrued and and often uh, uh, you know just not the, the the constructive discussion is often not being had. Um, is I think how we all feel, and there's some opportunities to to break that down a little bit more. So. Um, you know, we get the, the benefit of working together. Um, you guys obviously uh, also work with a lot uh, of the world's largest businesses kind of at the center of, of this transition. So um, first, thanks for taking the time, guys, to, to join and have this discussion. Um, you know, really, you know, our goal here was to have just a, a, a kind of casual open forum discussion around some of these things that, that, that we see and, and try to anchor some of the way that we're thinking about it. Um, so I guess first at the top here, uh, I'll introduce myself, you know, uh, my name's, uh, Kyle Jackson. I'm, uh, the CEO and co-founder at Tailspin. Um, we're, uh, an immersive learning company focused kind of at using uh, a new modality to help put a, a, a different foundation under the way that we, we navigate this transition in talent. And, um, and maybe John, I'll hand it over to you and Ashwin, but John, you want you to go first, just give an introduction of, of yourself and, and kind of what your, your day to day looks like. Well, it never looks the same, that's for sure, Kyle. Thank you. Um, yeah. John Goodyear, I'm a, I'm a managing director at Accenture. I've spent 20 years deep in learning, helping people be a little bit better. Uh, I, I've done that on the consulting side. I've done that inside Accenture. Uh, I was also the, the HR lead for our project avatar. So we looked at how we bring to life uh, immersive learning, immersive spaces, immersive collaboration at scale within Accenture. And then very naturally, I have always been interested on the on the AI side of things and, and seeing an interest in convergence across uh, those technologies of, of, of immersive and, and generative AI and what that meaning, not just for learning, but as you begin to flow that through the entire human capital model. So super excited to talk about that today. And I'll hand it over to my colleague at Accenture, Ashwin. Thanks, John and Kyle. Ashwin Acharya, I'm based in San Francisco. I lead AI for Accenture's talent and organization practice. My day is wonderfully weird every single day I wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yes, uh, so half about half my time is spent talking to our clients and off late, a lot of it is around Gen AI and how it's gonna impact HR, human capital. I also spend a bunch of time figuring out how to build some of these assets. So my teams are also involved in building proof of concepts, demos, client engagements across these topics. It's a, it's a fun space to be in. It is. And it, like you guys both said, I mean, every day is different and the space is evolving really, really quickly at this point, uh, you know, specific to generative AI and the changes that we kind of see coming to the, to the human capital model. So um, you know, so I've got some slides, but these are really more of just to, to help us anchor the discussion and uh, and jump around. You know, we we didn't necessarily um, overly structure this discussion because because we wanted to have an honest and kind of just open forum to to hear for, for others to hear some of how we're we're uh, we're bouncing around in this world. Um, but you know, to to start us off, right? A um, lot of headlines, a lot of headlines around what's going on, and, and some are are doom and gloom. Um, you know, some are, are centered on earnings calls and how companies are weaving this into their core tech stack. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of different discussions going on. Um, and I think, uh, within those, there's some really thoughtful ones, um, that, you know, a few of which I kind of pulled out here that I think are, um, are interesting and, 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 and they start to, to, to focus in on kind of, you know, how, how the skill makeup is going to change and, and also some of the both positive and and uh, predicted negative impacts, you know, balance. And so um, I think our goal is right. This is unpack some of that nuance um, because I think we we have a unique lens as to as to you know what is the thing that's happening tomorrow and what is the thing that's 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 actually quite a ways out. Yeah, maybe um, maybe Kyle, I'll ask you a question here, just in the interest yeah. of interactivity. Which which of these is the most interesting to you? And maybe John, that's to you as well. What's what's the most interesting thing when you see all of these headlines? And I'm, there are hundreds and millions more. What's most I, interesting? I, I mean, I have a very biased view because my whole focus is on solving one of them. <laughs> Go for it. Right. So, I mean, I think the, the Forbes one right in the, in the dead center is is in the age of artificial intelligence. We need to keep, we need our human skills to keep it real. 
So it's this, it's this migration of where we play in the productivity chain um, that I find so fascinating and, and really why we started the company. Um, and so I, I hope that to be true. You know, I'm, I'm devoting all my time and, and energy to making that true so that as we move through this, we get the benefits of, of AI and we get the benefits of abundance and all the cool things that are coming, but not at the, not at the trade-off of something that could be you know, really negative. You know, for me, I think it, it probably would have been the same one, but, but closely related to that, I think, is, is the 80 percent of, of U.S. workers seeing their jobs impacted. As a Canadian, I think that, that Canada is, is, a, is the same proxy, the same situation. And how do we help companies and individuals and employees and how do we help citizens to be able to use AI to be super powered and to use the positive side of this? Uh, and, and it's our responsibility, I think, to be able to to do that, to, to structure things and to help people see the power and potential here, because it is coming. Um, and I think there's a lot in the press about the fact that maybe, you know, can this be slowed down? Can we have a moratorium? I think generally the consensus is theoretically we might want to have that. Practically speaking, it's probably not going to happen. And so if this is coming, how do we help people be better? And what are the things that they need to focus on? I, the, that, the, the nature of our conversation today, uh, yeah. very, very different things about, you know, human plus AI than, than the world that we're living in right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pick on one thing you just said, John. I, I think the, the speed of this is what is the most interesting thing to me. Right. I mean, I mean, the cat's already out of the bag. There's only so much you can do in terms of restricting it. But it's actually moving so fast that it's sometimes difficult to keep up as to what's the latest and what's the best. I mean, it's moving probably moving faster than any other technologies we have seen so far. So for from my perspective, I think while all of this is interesting, this is going to happen faster than ever before. Yeah. I think that I, that's going to have follow-on knock-on effects that are going to be uh, very interesting to think about. I, uh, I just to to kind of you know give a view from uh, the startup side. Uh, I had a call with one of the major venture capital firms, you know, a few weeks ago, and we were walking through some of what we're trying to do, and and they actually their sentiment was what you just said, Ashwin. They're like, you know, they're like, this is so fascinating. Never have we seen a tech, or we can't remember a time where we've seen technology that is so fundamental to changing so many businesses all at once. Uh, and what they're talking about in that case was was large language models specifically, but but you know the knock on effects of that, of course. And so um, maybe just just before we before we jump into the next one, another another thing I think is good to anchor is is um, how do each of us think about the category of generative AI? Like Ashwin, you know you're you're, you're in in the in more of the actual uh, data science side of this. Like how how do you define it when you're talking to customers? What are the technologies that are part of that conversation and what are those that are maybe adjacent? I think when defining it to customers, I anchor less on the technologies because it's honestly, it's taking yeah. so fast, it's difficult. And more on what should they know about it, right? So unless you're talking to a core technology person, what do you actually need to know and be aware of, especially from a risk perspective and a mindset perspective. This is not like rolling out any other tools. This is not like rolling out Office where you roll it out and you're done. This is more of a, a set of tools, platforms that one, are constantly changing, but two, also are different from stuff we had before. I mean, yeah, language models are based on predicting what the next word is and they do it in more and more sophisticated ways. But at the end of the day, they're predicting the next word, maybe the next sentence sometimes or set of words. And that has its own limitations. So at least as of today, what should you know and what can it do and what level of risk are you willing to take, want to take, et cetera, is, is, is some of the most common conversations I have today. John, John I don't know is that, is that, yeah, does that resonate with you? Is that, is that the same way yeah. you're trying to frame with the conversation? Uh, absolutely. And as a non-data scientist coming at this from the function and human side, 
I, Ashwin called out something critical, which is this doesn't construct an output in the same way as AI that we've gotten used to, right? This isn't charting the optimal course. This isn't just um, you know finding a pattern uh, in visuals or in language and being able to discriminate and push that forward. That generative component of the next word, the next pixel, the next piece of code is is very different. And if you don't anchor in that, then you don't understand the implications of verity and bias and intellectual property and all of the things that people are throwing up as concerns, those are rooted in the way that that that, that the AI is 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 generating that that next word, that next token. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. in addition to the bias and so on, as you talked about John, explainability is also important. I think we're seeing more work in this field happening now. I just saw something yesterday which said people are starting to figure out how to explain the outputs from some of these models by figuring out which part of the language model is actually impacting a specific output more. I think that's going to end up being key, especially in the human capital space, where a lot of what yeah. we do has implications on individuals, people's organizations, societies. So we'll we'll need more and more of that explainability. Yeah, and I, actually you just kind of outlined something that I was going to jump to next. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move us to, to this because um yeah when this is such a big topic, you know, even when we, we and I think Ashwin you were the one that said like this is the way I'm I'm breaking it down when we when we were doing a quick prep, right? Which is is that we have to figure out what are the buckets in which we are talking about impacts and timelines. And so this is a super simple framework, but I think it's great for us as we kind of move through a bunch of the rest of the conversation, because um, when you look at it through the individual lens or the organizational lens or the societal lens, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more focused as to the problem you're trying to solve. And then similarly, like this timeline is like really hard to define, right? When you were talking about the change so quick, it's like what is what is now? Maybe maybe next twelve months is even is even too long for now, you know. Yeah. Like, but like just just for the sake of of uh, how we're anchoring it, right? Like I think this is this is the way that we were we were thinking through the various buckets and how we're kind of advising people and what we're even from a road mapping perspective and things like that. Um, so um, you know, so taking this framework, right? Let's rewind the clocks like like a year. Um, you know, there was there was a bunch of talent problems that all of us were inter interfacing with clients around. Um, you know, we were hearing about massive uh, uh, the Great Resignation. We were hearing about remote work and and, and further acceleration there. Um, and and that was basically at least my discussions were adding up to a lot of like talent acquisition and other talent you know challenges. And and the businesses were getting really. Uh, you know, stuck as to how to solve for some of these things, and it was causing quite a bit of pain. Um, I guess how I'd imagine that we were probably seeing similar trends there, but you know, what are you guys seeing? Like, like how are you seeing that migration? I guess is my question, because 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 you know, here you have this new tool that comes in too, and so it's like it's important to understand the backdrop in which it's entering, and there's 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 that kind of talent crisis backdrop that we were living, and then there's also this macro environment, and so I feel like those are two things that if this had entered in 2021, it'd be a very different reality, but we, it, it didn't. It's entering the conversation from a human capital perspective now, and that environment is is going to play a fact uh, uh, play a factor in kind of the uptake and how how I, you know, how I, you know, predict that businesses are going to grab a hold of it. So, I mean, I'm just curious, you know, what did, what are you guys, like, how do you think about that? So I'll, I'll go first. I, in some ways it hasn't changed at all. And in some ways it has changed dramatically. But, and <laughs> that's a, that's a very consulting answer to give. Sure. It depends. <laughs> um, but there, there's, there's still a talent shortage, if I can put it that way. Right, we still see it in the market, even even with all the changes in the entire. Um, Kali, I think we just lost sharing. Um, yeah, I just I just turned it off for a second, so we yeah. can just chat, and then we can jump through some other stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think it hasn't it hasn't changed for the roles that have been in demand. I think it has been in demand. I think what has changed for me is the conversation around getting people on newer technologies is getting more important. Getting people on to think ahead is getting more important than, than actually finding enough people, 
I think from a shortage perspective, I think I'm gravitating personally more to the, there are certain skills that are going to be short more than the fact that there is going to be talent shortages. Right. I, I think, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of, in terms of, is it a volume problem or is it a skill uh, problem? It's going to be a skill problem. Abs absolutely. Um, if, if I get a little myopic for a moment, I think about the conversations I was having a year ago, Kyle, to, to help our learning professionals. And, you know, we, on one hand, things are changing so quickly, skills, technology, business need, faster than learning can keep up. And on the other hand, we had cognitive overload happening in a significant way uh, yeah. for all of our learners and, and caught in between, you know, and we were look, talking, having some great immersive conversations about why is, is, you know, what we can do in the immersive space to be able to help our learning professionals and bring the business a little bit closer to the learner. We weren't talking about generative AI and the ability to create content quickly. We weren't talking about the ability to be able to deliver in the flow of work uh, in a much more uh, uh, pervasive way. And we were talking theoretically about how learning and performance support are gonna continue to collide and move together. All of a sudden go forward a year, and now we're saying not only is that the case, but we actually have some tools that are gonna allow learning professionals to do amazing things. And at the same time, be able to hopefully, you know, reduce some of that cognitive load on our learners by taking, you know, what we'll get into later in, in terms of how we might do that. So, so, so very tactically, I, we, were, we were having, we had some good tools. We just have, in my, in my view right now, an incredible way to help organizations begin to fill that, that skill gap internally at the same time as we're addressing that external skill gap that's also there, as we know, across the globe. I'm going to, I'm going to re, uh, reshare real quick, because this is, this is, um, uh, you know, kind of an interesting, um, moment, right? Like, like, uh, last week, uh, world economic forum put out its, its, uh, future of jobs, 2023 report. And, it, and, and really a lot of what you guys are just, just said is, is kind of captured in there. Um, both in the, just sheer volume and quantity aspect, but also the, the more importantly, like the actual skill shift. And when you stack those two on top, that's where you, you get to really like, how do we solve for both at the same time? And I think that's the, the really interesting opportunity for, for the three of us, right? As we're working through this, but um, I mean, just to summarize for others that haven't had a chance to read this yet, you know, basically uh, there's a whole lot of jobs that are going to be lost and there's a whole lot of jobs that are going to be gained. Um, the net of that is roughly 152 million jobs that they expect to 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 change you know change hands basically, um, representing about 23 percent of the workforce. And so, uh, and this is over the five year timeline. Um, and this report to to something Ashwin said earlier was uh, uh, was this report was actually started and mostly authored before Gen AI was in its current kind of acceleration curve. So you know it's all we're now asking that question of like. Are any of these stats accurate? Is this is this is this a baseline? Is you know, um, so I think that I think that does capture what we're seeing. Is there anything that you guys get when you see this kind of of, of data report that this that that stands out as, I guess, maybe not accurate or more than not accurate? I think this is what what this doesn't show is how many jobs are actually going to change dramatically lost and gained is one way of looking at it but even yeah. the gray stuff in the middle is yeah. actually going to change and some of the work we are doing at accenture right now is trying to figure out how do we determine what jobs are really going to change right so there are some jobs that are going to be very um are, are going to be using the augmented and using these tools a lot I think, yeah. John, you used the yes. example of content generation for learning and so on. Great. And then there's going to be some jobs whose nature fundamentally changes. Right. So if you if you if you think about the tools you have available today and the kind of jobs you do today, what we are trying to figure out right now is which jobs are actually going to change dramatically. You may you may not be automated, you may not, but because you have better tools at your fingertips maybe it becomes a game changing kind of a job. So I'm gonna use an older example of mine. If you think of underwriting in insurance, 
right? Once upon a time, it used to be based purely on such statistics and so on. Now, is it going to change with jobs like this? Think of product management as a newer example, right? Now you have mm -hmm. access to fast prototyping, quick prototyping. Gen AI allows you to do all of these things. I think, Carl, you were talking about some of the stuff you're doing at Tailspin. You can prototype stuff much faster than you could do. Does that change your life as a product manager? Maybe. I mean, the jury is still out a little bit on that one, but it's it's things to think about. The middle portion of that chart, which you just showed up, is also going to yeah. change dramatically. And how that changes is, is, a, is a really interesting question. Yeah, it's, it's, and we think about that at the task level to get to that overall impact, right? So what is going to maintain human? What is going to be automated? What is going to be essentially augmented, human plus, plus AI? And then what are the emergent jobs that are coming out as you think about being the interface between a generative AI and LLM and, and, and a customer and how do you think about that differently and what is the training that you may need to be doing back into a model in real time which is one of those emergent tasks so so I do think that the degree of job impact is going to be significantly greater than what's shown on that. And I think yeah, as yeah. we go to the next slide, I think I even think that the next slide is 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 probably under predicting um, the degree. And, and what we have to just get back to is what do we mean by by disruption? You know, um, you know, well, that 40, you know, so 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 as we look at this, that that's where I, that's where I go. I think it's I think it's bigger. And I, and I don't make that as an alarming statement. I think we're all going to learn how to do some pretty amazing things. Uh, and, and I don't see a lot of jobs that won't have some impact, particularly when you begin to add in, you know, the coding capabilities, uh, you know, to go with, you know, language capabilities and image capabilities. You get to do some pretty amazing things, as we'll talk about later, in really short order. Yeah, and and uh, you see different predictions, right? So like this this one here was the World Economics Forum, and they were saying forty four percent of workers' skills will be disrupted. Uh, another stat that came out of the OpenAI research, right, was was eighty percent of jobs will be affected. Yeah. So either way, either way, the the twenty three percent stat on that last slide isn't actually cap capturing the scale of of the, the the migration going on, the skill migration, the talent migration. You know, both are kind of happening at the same time, and so. Um, do you guys, this is actually something we haven't talked about at all. Um, do you, do you get the sense that businesses are starting to, I mean, this, this stats here would, would kind of indicate the businesses see that, you know, this, this graph on the right, right? Because it's, it's the world economic forum saying, here's what businesses are going to do about it. But do you see that to be true? Or is it like, is there an awakening happening? Where, where are people in understanding that, that scale? Yeah. So Fantastic. If you go to the next slide, Carl, I think that the triangle slide with the individual organization, it's a good segue into what you're thinking about there. So I think this one? Yeah. You know, the, the individual organization society um, slide. Uh, back, back up here? Yeah. I think the, the reason I just want to come back here, the, the question you asked, a lot of what we're talking about was in the in, at the individual level so far. Now, yeah. as individual jobs, roles, work changes, organizations had to figure out how to stay on top of all of this, right? I mean, it's just like people will use these models if it makes their life easier, irrespective of what organizations actually say. So there's a complete aspect around figuring out how do you manage the risk, some of the ethics around this, some of the risk around this, some of the change around this, how do you get the best use of this in an organization? So there's one set of organizational conversations we are having right now around, as an example, change management. Yes. Right. You you want to do all of these things, but it's not like rolling out a new tool. I think I said this earlier in the conversation. Yeah, yeah. So what else yeah. do you need to account for? And then the second is, if you look at it from a pure linear automation lens, yes, this can automate a lot of the work, but how do you start thinking a little bit more about the disruptive lens where you're actually using it to strategically change your business objectives and goals by dramatically either reducing cost, opening new lines of business, right? doing things more efficiently, or maybe doing things better sometimes. right? I think yeah. organizations are all beginning to figure out some of those things. And I know a lot of that is general right now, but that's where I see most organizations right now. I and mean, of course, some are far ahead in terms of thinking about this, but most are just grappling with the fact that this is new technology we need to understand the implications of a lot of these things. And we need to figure out 
one, what's the what are early wins we can use, and then what are long term strategies we ought to adopt around this. It's very early stage. I think the um, because these are two these are two parallel timelines. The way you kind of laid it out, right? There's like the risk and governance and understanding the impact, and then there's the uh, measurement of outcomes and benefits. Um, and so the way I the way I would put that into the now next future bucket, right? Is is like we're just in this massive stage of of planning. Like I think everybody realizes, at least from my perspective, it feels like everybody realizes this is this has changed the game for the organization. And for some number of months, it is like intense planning, um, but centered around a completely different work model, maybe different combination, like John, what you were saying, like deconstructing jobs as a, as a way to get to that new work model. Like it's just an intense period of planning, I would think it feels like, and I don't know how long that goes on for, but um, I mean, that's what I maybe, hear when yeah, you Yeah, maybe that. I'll just, 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 I will add on to that. It's planning and testing in some ways, right? Because I think we do have to, prototype, test out stuff to see what, what meets the appetites of organizations and what is most effective at organizations, right? Some of these are, let's be honest, theoretical right now, right? We are, we are right. in a planning in a theory phase, right? How can we actually try these out, see if they actually make a difference? Um, John, I don't know what you think. Yeah, I, I, I completely do. I think, I think that the um, uh, one, we have to experiment. Uh, the, the, the slide we were just showing has a pyramid. It's not really a pyramid um, when we, when we sure. think about that. Actually, and, and, and as is the case, individuals are actually at the center of both societal and organizational because, you know, was it nine, nine months to 100,000 or 100 million users for TikTok and it was two months for, for, for ChatGPT, yeah. right? So yeah. people are using this now. People are smart. So their expectations are changing. How the customer expectations of how businesses interact with their customers are changing right now as a result of this as people begin to think about this. So you can't wait to just plan. You have to experiment in multiple ways because it won't just be the tasks and jobs, which you know is where I, we spend so much of our time. It's going to be in the business models that, that Ashman was talking about. It's going to be in the ways that I interact with a customer because those customer expectations are changing as fast as the possibilities for the organization. And I think, so So when I, when I think about it in that lens, uh, yeah, I mean, my, my advice is absolutely uh, thoughtful experimentation right away. And then as you begin to see the potential and value, you also have to then cross all of the considerations of how you do this responsibly and ethically and 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 to make sure you're dealing with some of the, the challenges that we talked about a little bit before. And so so that's why I, I would say if it's just planning, you're probably you're probably not taking you know an aggressive enough stance. Yeah. Yeah, I think the other the, the another piece in planning which crosses over for me with what you were saying, John, is is um, almost regardless of where it lands, they're they're you know going back to the skill shift. You know, some of uh, uh, what we were hardwired to, you know, our entire education system, you know, uh, a lot of our organizational structures, uh, even individuals, as we like promote ourselves to to new opportunities. You know, it, it's, it's like we're always proving our knowledge, proving our knowledge, right? Like we know the answer. Um, and, and one of the big shifts that we talked about was, right, is like this shifts it the other way around. It's like, it's all about knowing the right question. And, and that's a different skill, like, like intense questioning, active listening, kind of constantly figuring out how to iterate on the problem in a, in a, in a structured way, isn't necessarily a skill set that we've been teaching people, uh, as a, as like superpower. And so it's, to me, it's like, no matter where we land with, with where it's implemented, how it's implemented. It's like there is some fundamentals that you can kind of, uh, as a business, right? Even as an individual, take make it really personal, right? Like, what do I do? You know, I wake up tomorrow. What am I working on to try and make sure that this doesn't hit 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 my my front door in a way that I'm un that's unexpected? So, I mean, that that's that that was kind of the aha moment. You know, I think for me years ago was is like that's the piece to work on. Um, obviously, that's that's what we wake up every day and do. But um, I mean, how do you guys? Uh, I mean, that's a hard thing to advise, I guess, is where I was going with that is, is like, it, it, it's an abstract, like, you know, kind of concept, but a fundamental one. So, like, I don't know, how, how do you make that more real, I guess, or how do you guys feel about 
making that more real for for you know for for individuals and customers. Um, it, it's it is a difficult question, right? And especially because we are early stages in the, this technology. Although I do wonder whether calling it early stages is now fair or no. It's not like this is brand new. I mean, it, language models have been there for a while, but it's just yeah, taken yeah. off right now. Um, I think showing people practically how to do this, I think, John, you used the right words, responsibly, um, how to do it responsibly and fast so that they can use this in their day-to-day, -day, I think is going to be critical. Um, maybe proof of concepts of how, how this would work in a particular client's environment of what it would solve. Because a lot of what we are seeing right now is great in terms of, I'm gonna call them pre-built videos, but in terms of, but practically speaking, when it hit, when the rubber meets the road, if you're talking about as an example, I'm just gonna take a couple of examples, right? The most common use case I've heard for organizations is answering employee queries, right? You spend mm -hmm. a lot of time and effort doing that. Okay, great. Now, if you were to automate this using some of our newer language models, how successful is it? How correct is it? Right. right. And we have to be able to answer those questions with some fair degree of confidence before companies will actually bite the bullet, which is why I, I go back to saying, hey, we need to be able to experiment with the kind of things you have so that you can see what's possible and what's not, and then put guardrails around the stuff that's not possible. Right. Some, you know, when you're talking about yeah, compensation and stuff like that, maybe it's just too risky. Maybe when you're talking right. about regular employee queries, maybe it's fine. Right. But It'll depend on an organization's risk appetite. It will depend on how you're able to tune the language model and actually get good answers out of it. All of those good things. Yeah, it, it's going to depend very much on on the on the cost of being wrong. Um, you, you know, I'm, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm going to I'm going to borrow that term, John. Cost of being yeah. wrong. <laughs> but but as I look at this, it's not just testing the technology. I think that's the thing that maybe that's why. I get so excited about the space because it's going to be human in the loop in some way, shape or form for, for, for quite a while on most things. And so as we do this, we're testing how humans plus generative AI work together and we're learning on the human side as well. So part of the testing that we're doing is, okay, great. We, we've trained it in this way. We're seeing these outputs. How are those outputs being used? Okay, what are the humans doing with those outputs, right? What's the role that humans will have in training back into the model, right? To continue to 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 uh, to help, uh, you know, fine tune it. And and so I think there's a, a lot of the human side that we don't know yet, uh, and we're going to have to figure out. And that's as important to get right if you're going to make organizational change as as the technology. And so anytime you're experimenting, if your experiment finishes with the, the end result of output and doesn't look at the utilization of that output with humans and with customers, then then you're not going the mile that, that may be the hardest uh, yeah, in, in yeah. terms of the change. Yeah, that's where I, that's that's where my brain went when you said that is is that's that's the mile that's always been the most uh, elusive. Right. Um, from, from like a learning practice or a talent practice out to, to the end. And so um, I, I'm thinking about that, you know, around, you know, some specific use cases, too. Um, and, and just going back to the, the fact that the macro backdrop is is this, you know, expected large kind of talent migration, as well as, a, you know, a, an economic environment that is looking for efficiency and stuff like that. So there's a lot of these, these factors that are going to they're going to ultimately we want to compress some of the the investment to outcome you know period right that that's really and 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 with confidence and so one of the things that um i i get excited about with generative ai is is I, you know one of the, you know i came into learning you know starting tailspins you know 7 years ago so i was you know coming from a different background but one of the things that that shocked me um was just the the time from issue identification to solution to building a solution to rolling out the solution to then measurement and and by the time by the time that actually happens like it's moved again and so it's like gosh we're just on a hamster wheel of 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 kind of not great solutions honestly is the way it felt um and so one of the things i get i don't know i think i feel like is is going to be uh, a topic at some point once we get through to some of the proof points that we're talking about like that that contraction of that middle right where like issue identification you know, context, relevance, 
the personas of who we're dealing with, the, you know, the issue, the, you know, the, the, the corpus of knowledge around the problem that we're dealing with and there's a solution. Right. And, and then and I feel like that's a huge component of measuring that, that ROI is like, cause if we get to the point where that's a more real time feedback loop than it is today, I'd say with most other modalities that we're, that we've had, um, now there's some real, uh, organizational change and that, and that's, that's where I feel like businesses are going to see just some massive benefits. So yeah. I wonder, uh, you know, that, that's not something that we're going to see tomorrow, but it's like, how do we put some, <laughs> put some feet in front of the one foot in front of the other to, to get to the point where that becomes a true aha. Yeah. Carl, maybe switching back to the individual level. I was, as you were talking, one of the things that occurred to me was at an organizational level, there's a lot to figure out. Do you think we have a fair sense of how individual work or individual skills will change. I mean, I hear a lot about prompt engineering and X and Y yeah. and Z, but if, if you think about from an individual perspective, what's what's going to change for individuals generally? What skills are going to be more important? What skills are going to be less? Do you have a point of view on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do. Um, I mean, well, one, I, I, I kind of had a point of view, I would say, prior to like really digging into the models this last while. And now I've got a view that's kind of more based on, you know, being in the weeds and working like the, the human plus machine aspect that John talked about. Um, I, you know, and, and another thing that kind of dawned on me as like, a, wow, man, that really set me up for a success, I think, is, you know, I, 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 I was a, a, a film editor for a period of my life, you know, and, and what you learn in film editing is you become a really, really, really proficient systems thinker, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have, you have a massive chain of connected events in your brain at any one time, and you're constantly shuffling them into an order that then assembles what you think is the best outcome. Um, and so like understanding the, the relationship between so many, you know, discon disconnected elements um, that ultimately need to come back into a clear story and a clear, clear line of communication like that's a real superpower in this environment. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, so, I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I think that's a, that's a really interesting example and a really nice way to put it, right? Because because now you're, comp I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase what you just said. And we are in some ways compressing a lot of what different people or different roles used to do, potentially compressing or shortening the time frames, potentially combining them into one. So the more you can do what you just call systems thinking or end-to-end -end thinking, I think the more successful you will be as an individual in the coming years. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah. Yeah, yeah be that, because I think the, we talked about it, Kyle, and the work we were doing, you know, there's coming up with the standard operating procedure for which prompts might be most helpful, which generative AI tools might be used in what sequence and all of those things, which is going to get you to a repeatable result. But it's that system thinking and it's that ability to make those connections that is going to further engender the creativity, right? Because what we're talking about or what are some of the things we think that humans are still going to have a pretty key role in and, and, and creativity is, is going to be one of them. Um, collaborating between humans, uh, continuing to understand compassion, empathy, and, and connecting to consumers and customers and thinking about what it really means to them and to employees. I think all of these things are going to be, you know, they've always been important, but they're going to be more differentiating because of, of so much of what's going to be done on the machine side you know, as we, as we move forward. So, so I think, I think that everyone's seeing that rise of human skills and we saw the quote earlier on when we started, but, but I, I've, I've certainly doubled down on, on what are the things we can do to help people think in creative complex ways and relate really, really well to other humans. Yeah. John, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit just because you used the word creativity a couple of times in there. Yeah. This is, this is an argument I've been having with a, a few friends and colleagues for the last few weeks. Is, the, is our definition of creativity actually changing? Because if you look at these language models, it can generate code, pictures, text. If you, if you use the loser's definition of creativity, you can say they can be creative to a certain extent. And I'm just playing devil's advocate here for a second. But are we changing our definition of creativity as a skill? Um. 
you know, I, 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 I put you on the I spot, didn't I? I try not to play it, Ashley, <laughs> but, but I, sometimes I can't help myself. Um, I, I, think, I think we are. Um, fundamentally, I think we are. Uh, and I think we're, we're changing in, in a couple of ways. Uh, we're going to have opportunities presented to us to see connections that we couldn't have even seen before because generative AI is going to be able to bring things to us. And as we are able to fine tune our questions, we're going to have revelations that would not be possible without generative AI. Second, we're going to be able to do some things that very, very few people could do. And we're, we're going to have more people in society able to do them. I love art. Uh, my wife and I collect art uh, and, and, and we love it. I can't create it. I know what I like. And I wish I could create it, but I can't. Mid Journey now gives me an opportunity to do some really cool things of just saying, I had something in my head and I didn't have the, John's coordination was never going to get that down on ink or paint or in any way, shape or form and suddenly bringing that to life. That to me is a, is, is for me as an individual, Ashwin, is a level of creativity that was out of reach practically right. for me, which is now within reach. So, so yes, I, the, the the, 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 the very you know, simplified answer is, I think our definition of creativity will, uh, will change and what's possible at the individual and collective level will change in terms of, um, in terms of our definition. I think there's some re like really simple and practical examples of, of both of these, it, like going back to systems thinking, going back to communication being like a key outcome of this and then, and then tying some of what Ashwin was just saying in terms of creativity. Um, or both of you guys are saying in terms of creativity, like I think of, of two use cases that come to mind. One is, you know, my sister is an interior designer uh, and, the, and the, the complexity of feedback loops with clients to be able to get everybody on the same page to then just agree to do a thing, like in the amount of coordination costs and challenge and, and honestly real waste disruption, you know, uh, uh, you know, everybody ends up unhappy. Like it's actually in that communication layer. So all of a sudden now, you know, as a, person who doesn't have any capability to 3D model my apartment or my house, I can still communicate to, to that designer in a way that I never could before. And that, that, and that communication gap is just, you know, really uh, become a lot more effective. Um, and so I feel like that's like one of those examples where um, it's so obvious to see that that's such a, 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 a super, super challenge without this, these skills. And all of a sudden now, because of it, like, I would imagine that's going to ripple through construction. That's going to ripple through a bunch of different places where we haven't been able to communicate with you each other effectively that way. Um, Kyle, is it yeah. is it is it fair to just say, you know, identifying friction points in a process to put my consulting hat on, and mm -hmm. th this can actually help us reduce slash eliminate some of those friction points. Of course, maybe the friction point then moves elsewhere. But it, at least some of today's friction points go away. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, that's what we've seen. Um, and and a, a lot of the uh, friction points, you know, if you just focus around communication, even, you know, that this, zooming that in, that was the example I just gave. But like, you know, John and I were working through a, a, a workshop recently where we were talking about specifically learning and, and the friction points to go from, again, problem, problem identification, you know, solution design, you know, uh, and all the way out through measurement, there's just a ton of coordination and communication there that has to happen. And learning designers, narrative designers, instructional designers, um, you know, people ops, HR, they all have tools that they use now to try to, to kind of like shape that so it moves efficiently through the chain. But what with the, the kind of semi, I think, aha moment that we all had together yep. is, is, is it literally, again, you had that moment of discovery by the way that we were we were doing this, right? John was like, like we were, I think the, the term we end up using is a learning director now, like it's because things are being surfaced to you, solutions are being surfaced to you, you're communicating in real time around those solutions, which is another layer of, of, of gain and efficiency and, and collaboration gain. And then, uh, and then your role as human in the loop is to constantly direct all these new in, uh, inputs that are coming back because your, your, your sea of opportunity and your sea of considerations has just gone, you know, a hundred X. Um, and so that's where we saw you know, we all got into like the flow state, just kind of hammering through those things. And it was really, it was really quite enjoyable um, versus the, if you flip that around, the friction in communication and, and, and designing that problem and everything, that's the, that's the work that I find, uh, at least personally, I find 
uh, unfulfilling. <laughs> um, and so, it, it, you know, that that was a really interesting flip on its head. I, I know we got to wrap on questions uh, shortly, but but Cal, I, I think you know, reflecting on that, one of the things that we we came up with together was the recognition of of the fact that you know we're always choosing you know quality, time, and cost, and trying to yeah. choose two of them. What we're seeing in the learning space is superpowering our learning professionals and being able to do you know the quality is 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 top notch. And yet we're taking cost and time out of that. And that responsiveness that you talked about closing down, I think was, was really interesting. Uh, one thing on communi communication, we, we don't have time today, maybe we'll go another time, but I'd love to look at the, the interplay between humans communicating visually versus communicating in language. We know that 80% right. of communication is nonverbal. And if we then take a look at the ability to take large language models, but also to use imagery, humans process images 50,000 times faster than text. There's something here in, in what new communication modalities will emerge over time with Gen AI. That's a, out 24 plus months, but I think it's an interesting thought as to what do we mean to communicate uh, in the same way that Ashwin was questioning what do we mean to, to have creativity? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that's like central to one of the, the things that's happening here. And I'd add another one, which is going from you know 2D you know, specific to the immersive world, right? Going from 2D communication to, 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 to fully spatial communication as another element of that. And so the, yeah. the, the super interesting thing, right, is, and this is what's so fascinating about, you know, large language models is it became the key to unlock a bunch of these things. And so it's like, it, you know, that's the Rubik's cube that, you know, the Rosetta Stone, obviously, that, that is now making us to be able to, you know, prompt in, create a visual expression, use that to communicate instead of language. And it's like once you ripple that all the way through, I mean, that's that that's probably um, if you were to look at that overall job disruption, it's like that's a, that's a large portion of the actual job disruption. It's not just like automating somebody out of the out of the workflow. Um, you know, you guys were saying it as well. Like it, it, it's more about like, well, what's the new job? Uh, because now I, I'm communicating, you know, 10,000 times as much information. And so I'm having a very different relationship with my customers, very different relationship with my colleagues. Like, you know, do, do we work less? Do we do more? You know, like what's the, you know, what, who knows where that lands? But I think that's the, that's the super interesting thing about, about um, how these things kind of, you know, become additive to each other, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kyle, any, any, um, what else would you want to, 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 to wrap up with before we go to questions? Anything else that you haven't explored before we, we go to some Q&A? Because I'm very interested to see uh, what's on people's minds and, and where they're going with this. Yeah, I think um, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, think, I think the, the expression of a lot of the the or the, the expression of a solution around a lot of what we're talking about, you know, is and it, it may not be obvious, so I'll kind of state it more obviously. Um, is I think my hypothesis is is that you know generative, uh, conversational based learning, you know, in spatial modalities is going to be like basically that superpower to to connect a lot of these dots. Um, and if that wasn't obvious as we were going through this, it's like, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's, why, that's why we're focusing all of our energies on building the, the ability to kind of unlock those different things. Because it is, it is, how do I become a better communicator, right? That's, a, that's and, and we, and for a period of our, our history, we were just mentioning that as soft skills training, right? Um, but it is also, how do I become a better systems thinker to like connect these, this, these disparate concepts and, 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 and be able to express them. And then it's also like, well, what happens going back to John, you said something about a uh, uh, cognitive load, like employees had an overwhelming cognitive load because there was just so much going on that it was like, you just had this fatigue that was happening. It's like, how do we, how do we change that? Because we're in a period now where, where we are, there is going to be a lot more happening in the same period of time. And so we have to, as, as individuals, it's like, how does that not just become a crushing sense of, of obligation and, and work? And so, um, yeah, to me, it, it feels very, uh, the solution feels very uh, visible. Um, it's still a lot of chapters, you know, there's still a lot of, you know, Ashwin, you were saying about the technology kind of uh, hurdles for enterprise adoption a little bit in some of your, your comments. And so uh, working through those hurdles is, is kind of now the hard work, I think. Yeah. Um, 
the practical work. Yeah. The practical work. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, still, those... I still don't know. Sorry, go ahead. As I say, I still, as I say, I still don't know where it lands, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but at least I, I know that there's a supporting solution here that's going to help soften the landing in a major way. Um, it's just a question of of what does that actual other end look like? It's like if you, if somebody's predicting it right now, they're they're, I would say, uh, uh, maybe need to take another look <laughs> at their own ego or something. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, no shots at her hubris. Yes. Yeah, hubris. Yeah. For for all those who are listening in, if you have questions, please do type. We we wanted to make sure we reserve some time at the end just to answer any questions you might have. Kyle, do you have any questions in the Q and A we should be answering right now? I had one other yeah. topic. If we don't, but um, let's first see if there are additional questions. I've got a few. Um, let's see. So. Uh, well, very relevant to what we were just talking about. Um, somebody asked, you know, do you think uh, generative AI um, will replace structured dialogue and soft skills training? So very, very specific to what we're talking about. And, and, and absolutely. I mean, that I think what we're doing, uh, you know, together, right, is figuring out what are the steps to do that responsibly. And, and uh, with, again, going back to outcomes that, that we can predict, um, because the, it's got the right corpus of, of knowledge, it's got the right a set of goals and parameters helping to um, uh, return that answer. Um, so I think absolutely. I mean, I, and I think personally, I think that's, you know, one to two quarters away before we're, we're probably at the place where that could be realized. Yeah, and maybe this this also touches a little bit on the, on the additional topic. I think it's also a question of how much can you personalize it to an individual versus uh, the right. Because especially with soft skills training, you're probably more likely, and, and the two of you are bigger experts at this than I am, but you're more likely in my head at least to get a better ROI if you customize it to a person's history, background, personality, what have you, right? Any any specific, I'm just extending the question a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. I mean, basically what we're talking about now is adaptive. So is that there's adaptive and there's generative. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and adaptive is is I showed up with one set of needs and one set of traits and one set of gaps, and I need to get to the same potential outcome as John, who showed up with a different set of needs, different set of skills, different set of gaps. And so, how do we how do we manage that por portion of the input? Um, of course, there's some sensitive topics there around around individual data and such that that go into that. So, yep. I don't know, what are your thoughts, John? Yeah, I I I think. Um... I think what that's going to do is it's going to be hyper personalized uh, in some ways to help with learning styles, with where I am in the learning journey, et cetera. But I think the fundamental underlying component of this is it takes practice to build a neural pathway. And yeah. that practice is possible through what we're talking about from an immersive and generative experience. Our brain right. is, is more connected to it because it's, it's feeling the, the reality of it. And uh, it's also going to keep changing, which is how we develop mastery. Mastery of a skill isn't to be able to apply it in the context in which you learned it. Mastery of a skill is how you apply that skill in previously unseen situations. So right. I'm really excited about not just skill acquisition, but skill mastery using immersive uh, and generative elements of learning. That to me is what we've always been looking to do. It's what we did when we apprenticed. If somebody was apprenticing yeah. 2000 years ago, they were essentially building a skill and then being asked to apply it in all these different yeah. contexts with a master guiding them. We are approaching the ability to do that at scale in some really interesting ways that was really hard to do without great cost. So, so um, you know, that, that's, that's why I'm, I'm super is so supercharged that yes, there's a lot to be done, a lot of the work, uh, as Ashwin called it, to, to get there. But I think the, the the possibilities are totally worth it, particularly because the skills we're talking about are those human skills, those durable skills, those things that we know are going to be part of this new partnership between machine and human. One of the um, uh, one of the things that uh, my team has heard me say a bunch of times, but but I. Uh... Uh, it was it was a true aha moment for me, and it just and it just you just called it back, which was that in some weird way, this whole um, moment in time we're looking at using these technologies to to achieve efficiencies and 
unlock other potentials, it becomes this really acute look in the mirror of what it means to be human. Um, and that's that I find super fascinating. And, 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 and I think just as a society going, going super macro for a second, the fact that we've evolved to the place where we can actually spend our time on that and that we um, actually have systems to potentially uh, push us further forward in that journey uh, while still accomplishing business outcomes and while still doing the things that we need as a, like a foundational structure. Um, I just find like super exciting that, that that's the, that's the age that I'm going to get to live through, you know? Um, and of course there's, uh, uh, I think it's, it's, it's hard to predict where that, that necessarily ends. But I think the thing you can predict, absolutely predict is that if we were to be on this call two years, two, three years from now, I would imagine that we, in our normal course of our days, are having much better discourse with people around around topics that we might be on the other side of the divide, you know, or just that we don't understand, or or challenges that we are are seemingly un, in, insurmountable, right? Um, so that's the that's the piece that I I get real excited about, and I think you know, um, take it outside of the scope of work. I just think that's something that we need, you know. Generally, I mean, we 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 are a glo we are a very global uh, 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 you know, workforce and, and society at this point. And, and we have very different contexts and very different views and very different histories. And, and so there's natural just friction in there because it's impossible for me to understand John's view. Um, and if I think I can, you know, I'm, I'm already setting myself by him, him up for failure. So that's where I get super excited about all this. I mean, of course, gains and productivity and stuff are fantastic. And we're going to really make some, I think some amazing strides, but that's the piece that I think is going completely missing from that top line narrative. Yeah, I, I, I love the way you frame that. And then the luxury that we have as we think about this, bring it back to responsibility. How do we make sure that we are democratizing access? And how do we help you know, this have a societal impact that is positive and, 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 and there are going to be unintended consequences. There's going to be some intended consequences that we're going to have to work through. Uh, and there's a question in the chat, Ashwin, I'm going to throw to you, which was around, can we predict which occupations are going to be sort of most at risk? Uh, I like to bring you the typical ones, uh, Ashwin. Uh, I've got a thought. I'm, I know I'm, Kyle does, but I'll, I'll start with you. I'm, I'm trying to avoid answering that question. No, I'm kidding. Um, I think we have research ongoing right now to be able to answer that question in two ways. One is more than replaced, it is more of which roles jobs, so we're going down to the level of jobs, have the most um, tendency to be automated or augmented. And then there are roles that have the most tendency to be redefined, right? Which may not be, which will change dramatically. So the short answer is yes. I think we are probably a few weeks away from getting to an exact list. But I think if you look at some of the research either Accenture has put out or other companies have put out, it does talk about the potential level of impact. Now, the caveat I would add there is right now, it's all potential. Mm -hmm. um, reality may actually be very different just given the nature of the beast right now. Yeah, there's a corporate view and a societal view, right? And the corporate view is going to, we're going to have an answer for what jobs are going to be created when you can put these things together with a creative person who wants to be part of the gig economy. We haven't even explored that. We don't have time today, but that, that's an important part of it. Kyle, I know you're going to jump in. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still going to a similar place. So so that's the that's the other unpredicted piece. And I think I actually think it's really healthy to have these predictions out just because at least anchors the conversations um at an organizational level and, and, and does give some waypoint to individuals to go hmm am i actually in the path of this in a way that i didn't expect which is which is probably what ends up prompting on some of what you just said right like yep. if i'm if i'm if i'm a coder or a lawyer or somebody that might end up on that list and i didn't expect that you know nine months or a year ago what do i do with that information right i get to work with it usually and i have a very interesting set of skills which will again stack with this technology to probably do, you know, an exponential leap in, in another direction that was unexpected. So I, I feel like that's why I believe the whole thing has become so unpredictable. Um, because as soon as you actually roll up your sleeves and start using some of these tools, like I haven't, I haven't coded in 20 years and I'm building prototypes over breakfast, you know, just because I can. And because my, my brain has an idea and I'm like, well, what if I could take that one step further? Next thing I know, I'm six steps further. And I'm like, holy cow. 
So it goes to that that idea of even communicating like interior design. It's like it's like take that same concept and apply it in every single direction of needing to communicate your ideas and, and unblock yourself. And it's like that's the piece that's just so unpredictable to me. That's but also so so exciting. You know, that, that feels like a look in the mirror on both the good and the bad side of that uh, for all of us as we think about what we do and how that's going to change. Uh, yeah. Kyle, I just want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. Uh, not a topic any of us have answers on one worthy of exploring. Thank you for being our host and our guide. Yeah, no, sure. thank you guys for doing this. And uh, obviously, a much, uh, many, many more discussions to come. So this is just a great forum to start this and hopefully others will uh, pick it up and carry it forward.